Hi guys, Adam from Middles Panel Builders for another Tech Tip Tuesday. In today's video, we're going to discuss diagnosing CAN bus faults, uh, what some things might look like, and how you can uh, try to address them and, and diagnose them in the G3X system. So CAN bus is actually a fairly simple system when you break it down to its physical wiring layer. Where it becomes more complex is when you add the computer side of things to it. CAN bus is all about proper timing, and proper electrical setup so that it can do its job. It is fairly resilient. The two things that will kill it though are an open circuit or a short circuit. Anything else, and actually if you cut your CAN bus in half, then usually the items on either half of the CAN bus will still communicate. So again, it is fairly resilient, but there are certain things that can happen that will bring it down to its knees, which is why in a G3X Touch system, we utilize backup RS-232 paths for things like the AHARS and the engine monitor so that you can still have some instrumentation if your CAN bus ever were to go down. So first let's talk about what we can look at in the G3X Touch to determine CAN bus faults and then after that we'll talk about some of the physical tests we can do on the wiring to see what's going on. So here we are on the uh, G3X Touch display in configuration mode and you'll see that we've got some items over here that are red X'd. Uh, this EIS, or rather the magnetometer, keeps going to a red X and then to the non-calibrated triangle. We are on the roll servo here, and even though it's green checked, you can see we have a network error rate that keeps jumping up from 0%. Unless you turned on power to certain units, you should never have a network error rate of anything other than zero. So we need to figure out on this system why that network error rate keeps jumping around. If we look at something else, this magnetometer here, it's sitting pretty consistently at a higher error percentage and that kind of makes sense because the magnetometer is on the other side of the CAN bus physically speaking. Uh, we have EIS failed so we have no engine indications right now. Our audio panel is completely failed even though it's powered up right here. So we know that we definitely have some issues that we need to look into. So the one thing that we can do is in config mode we can push menu and show network diagnostics and you can see that we have network transmit warning, receive warning, network error passive, and network bus off. So network bus off is something you would see if you had a dead short and there's just absolutely zero bus activity. Passive errors, and I'm kind of extrapolating my own opinion here, so uh, I may not be 100% accurate with this, but in my experience, a passive error is a problem on the CAN bus that can't be attributed to a specific item. Receive warning means that data that has come in on the CAN bus is um, not right, it's corrupted basically. And then transmit warning will increment when the unit reports that it can't transmit properly in the CAN bus. Uh, let's have a look at another unit, the ADA HARS for example, and you can see that we've got transmit warnings here, which the ADA HARS does transmit quite a bit of data on the CAN bus, so it makes sense that we're seeing transmit receive warnings and we have no passive errors here because it's been able to attribute problems to these two things. So let's uh, go ahead and look at some of the physical things that we can check to determine why these errors are coming up. So when diagnosing CAN bus, there's three things that we have to keep in mind. First is the architecture of the CAN bus. The CAN bus is supposed to be a daisy chain network. So you have two end devices and then you have two wires, CAN high and low, and they go point to point to each device in the middle. What that means is that CAN high at any point on the CAN bus will have 100% perfect continuity or should to any other device CAN high on that same bus, same for CAN low. We also have to remember that there are terminators on the CAN bus. So at each extreme end, in this case the GMU 11 and the roll, or excuse me, the pitch GSA 28, these are the ends of the CAN bus. They have terminators installed. A terminator is a 120 ohm resistor that bridges CAN high and CAN low together electrically. When you have two of those, resistors that are in parallel will have in value if they're the equal amount. So what that means, that was a bit of a rough way to say it, but basically if we have two 120 ohm resistors, when they're in parallel, your total resistance is 60 ohms. So a perfectly healthy CAN bus, you should be able to touch CAN high and CAN low and get 60 ohms. So we'll do some of those checks right now. First thing to note, I turned off all the power 
to the units because you can't do a resistance check when you have a unit attempting to transmit on the CAN bus because it's throwing voltage in. Uh, the other thing to remember is do not check resistance at a terminating device because you will remove the terminator and you'll get false numbers. So I'm going to go to this GSA 28 over here. This is the roll servo and we know for a fact that it is not a terminator because it has two CAN wires coming into it. If this was an end unit, there would only be one CAN wire coming in. And all we need to do is pop our pins into CAN high and CAN low. So what we do here is we make these little jumper pieces with males and females and all kinds of different D sub ends on it so that we can use them to front probe these connectors and not damage them. So I want to jump into our CAN wires here on pin one and pin two. And then we are going to take a meter reading. Okay, so we have a meter here turned into ohms mode. I'll get this set up so you can see it on the camera. So remember, we're looking for 60 ohms when we touch CAN high and CAN low on a healthy CAN bus. So let's see what we get. Okay, so we're getting 40 ohms. So what we have to consider is that 40 is a third of 120. So that tells us that we have an extra terminator somewhere in this CAN bus or potentially another wiring issue. But since we're at perfectly 40, we have a third terminator somewhere. So we need to go chase it down. Now, for just a moment, let's pretend that the CAN bus ohmed out okay right there and it showed 60. Another check that we would do is verify that CAN high on one device is also CAN high on another device. In other words, that there's basically zero ohms from one to the next. So I'm going to grab our GSU-25 back here, which is on the CAN bus, and I'm gonna pop one of my pins into CAN high over here, which is pin one on this connector as well. And now, if I touch these together, you see we get a perfect, basically a perfect zero ohms. I mean, we're working within the resistance of the meter itself at this point. So we need to, we only have an issue so far of too little resistance on the CAN bus. So we need to go chase that down. We're probably not chasing down a CAN high and low swap. The reason I picked the GSU-25 to go to is because that is one of the units on the display that was having problems, but the roll servo was not. So that is another little bit of a tip. When you're diagnosing CAN bus issues, sometimes one unit is the only thing that has the problem. So I've seen it where CAN high and low were reversed on one unit only. That one unit never showed up on the CAN bus and everything else was there, but it had a small network error rate that was blipping. And then you unplug that unit, the CAN bus is perfectly fine, no more network error rate, and then you go there and you find out it's flip-flopped. So that's why I went to here just to make sure that nothing was reversed. So now that we know that our CAN high and low appear to be okay and that we just simply have too little resistance. We're going to find the extra terminator, we're going to remove it, and then we're going to come back and do one more test on what we should have as a healthy CAN bus. Okay, we found our extra terminator, we removed it, so now we should have a healthy 60 ohms on the CAN bus. And you can see we have 59.6 well within the margin of error. So now, We'll go ahead and plug our servo back in, and then we'll get back onto the G3X display in configuration mode and make sure that our CAN bus is in good shape. Okay, so we're back in configuration mode here, and now let's see what we've got going on in the CAN bus. So I went ahead and turned back on the uh, network diagnostics, and you can see that now we have a network error rate that stays at 0%. We do have a couple of the RX warnings. This is not uncommon to see a very small number of these as things boot up and uh, get onto the CAN bus. As long as it doesn't keep counting, we're fine. So, and just for uh, reference, this is red x because we have an invalid outside air temp because the probe's not connected right now, in case you're seeing that. But let's grab uh, the standby flight display, G5, looks good. Roll servo looks good. You see all of them have at least one receive warning on them and again that's just simply because the system when it boots the CAN bus needs to more or less calibrate itself and figure things out. Uh, we'll come back down to the GAD 27 yeah so everything's looking good here uh, so we can call this CAN bus fixed everything's in perfect shape. One other 
potential issue that I want to talk about is a CAN bus that's too long because this is a problem I've seen a few times, especially if you're not using the Gigaflight or Carlisle IT CAN bus wire that Garmin specs in the manuals. In the certified world, you're required to use that. In the experimental world, they recommend it, but they don't force you to use that special CAN bus wire. Now, the fact is that CAN bus wire can exceed $4 a foot, so it's not cheap, but the reason is because it is impedance matched to 120 ohms so that you can get longer distances on CAN bus without having issues. So what will happen is when you have too long of a CAN bus, you'll start seeing blipping CAN bus uh, network error rates, but usually you'll notice it when maybe you turn on the autopilot switch or something, or if you have more devices coming online onto the CAN bus, suddenly another device will go offline but then when you turn off those new devices that you just turned on, whatever device had a problem suddenly is okay again. Uh, there was one example that comes immediately to mind where it was a kit fox. The CAN bus length was getting up there because the magnetometer was out in the wing. And what would happen is the autopilot switch would come on, the magnetometer would red X immediately, and then shortly a heading issue would come up on the G3X. Turn off the autopilot switch, suddenly the heading was perfectly fine. What we ended up finding out was that if we unplugged other units unrelated to the autopilot, with the autopilot on, the magnetometer would come back at that point as well. In that case, we switched the CAN bus wire out for the impedance match stuff, and the problem went away. So if you're having CAN bus issues like that, but everything physically looks good, consider the length. Anything over 65 feet, you really need to be using that uh, special impedance match CAN bus wire. I know this one was a little bit wordy, but hopefully you guys were able to follow along. CAN bus is one of those things that can become very complicated, especially if you don't totally understand it. So hopefully you can use this as a good troubleshooting guide. This certainly covers probably 95% of what we've seen out in the field ourselves. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to leave a comment. We're happy to help out. Otherwise, we'll see you in the next Tech Tip Tuesday.